What, what we are going to do today, we are going to use it uh, in a case that is maybe of more di direct cryptographic interest. We are going to look at what happens if the finite field you consider is a finite field in characteristic two. So we are going to look at gf of two to the k. And we are going to, tr to look at uh, how you can uh, adapt this algorithm uh, to do the discrete log computation for this, uh, for, for this specific setting. Okay? So lots of things are going to be identical to what I did yesterday. So I'm going to repeat a little, but it cannot hurt too much. And uh, so we are going to look at this in characteristic two. And then I will going to add the new ingredients that we didn't see yesterday. I'm going to show in characteristic two how you can take an arbitrary element in the finite field and move it down to, to compute its log. So move it down to the element we already know. Okay. So and there will be one question. I uh, will. Uh, uh, I need to. I need to address. Uh, someone asked me yesterday is. Yes, but you are explaining how you compute logs in your specific representation of the finite field. Uh, but, but usually you are not interested by that. You are interested by computing in the representation that is used by the cryptographic protocol or whatever thing you want. Okay, so how do you move from, from run one representation to the other? Okay, so in fact, uh, this part is very easy. If you have two representations of the same finite field, gf of 2 to the k, you have two diff distinct representations and you just want to, to move logs from one to the other. Okay, so in this field, so I'm going to take one representation of f of 2 to the k, which is just going to be f2 of x divided by some irreducible i1 of x. Okay, <laughs> so divided by the ideal generated. So this is one way to represent the finite field. Okay, and I'm going to call f1 uh, alpha 1, the root of this one. So this is also going to be F2 of alpha 1. <coughs> so any element is going to be represented as a polynomial of degree k minus 1 at most with coefficient in GF2 and involving powers of alpha, alpha 1. Okay, and the other representation you have for the same finite field is just essentially the same thing but with a different irreducible polynomial. F2 of alpha 2. And the question is, how do you move from this representation to this one? That's the only thing you, we, want, we, we need to know. And it's quite easy to move from one representation to the other. It suffices if we have something which is expressed in this one, so as a polynomial in alpha 2. If I want to move it and express it as a polynomial in alpha 1, it suffices to be able to compute some expression of alpha 2 as a polynomial in alpha 1. If you can do this, you are set. Everything is done. Okay, so how do you do this? Very easily, you just take the polynomial that defines alpha 2 and you use a polynomial factoring algorithm in this finite field to factor it. Okay, so you just factor in this finite field you factor this irreducible polynomial. Well, since we are in a next, uh, uh, already in an extension of degree k, this is going to factor into linear terms. You choose one of the roots you have found. You say, you, and you, you say, okay, this root is going to be the representation I choose for alpha 2 in my, uh, in my finite field, and that's it. So it's very easy to move from one representation to the other. So it's not important at all that I am using uh, this specific representation I have built uh, implicitly to do my discrete log computation. Okay? Is that fine with everyone? Okay, so now I can just forget about the, the, the outer world and the representation that was given to me and I'm just going to do everything in my, uh, in my efficient representation. Okay. So this is not difficult, and, and in fact, if you use uh, if you use magma to define your, your finite field, you can even even ask it 
to do it, so you, you give two definitions of the, of the same finite field with two different definitions, and you ask it, you ask Magma, okay, find an embedding of one field in, in the other, and it will do it automatically, you have nothing to do. Okay, so it's black magic, it, it works. Okay, so I am in, the, in this field, in characteristic two, and I want to make this work. So what I need to do is uh, choose uh, my smoothness basis, so decide what are the small, the elements which are going to be in the small set, uh, in which, for which I want to, to find relation. And once I have uh, chosen that, uh, we will move to see what we do in, uh, in the bivariate polynomial ring, what, which kind of polynomial we choose to send on both sides. Both sides. And we will also, of course, have to determine the degree of F1 and F2 that we are going to select. So we have a few parameters to define, but it will be, it will be a result. Okay, so the set of smoothness, the, the smoothness basis is simply to, going to be what? It is going to be polynomials, uh, H of X and H of Y. So I'm going to take polynomial in X and in Y. I'm going to put them in my, uh, in my smoothness basis. And the only thing I require is that, is that the degree of this polynomial is smaller than some bound. Okay? I will determine the bound later on, but that's it. You just say, okay, I'm going to take all polynomials to the, up to degree, let's say, 20 or something. And that will be it. Okay? So, of course, I'm going only to include irreducible polynomials in the basis for the same reason that for the linear C, I only included prime numbers, because if you want to factor stuff, you only have irreducible factors, or you can continue to factor, so it's the factors are useless. And uh, of course, the polynomials are going to be unitary. So the head monomial is going to have coefficient y. Why? Because if it doesn't, you just factor the coefficient out, and you know that you can ignore the log of the of, the, of this constant factor, so I will assume that all my polynomials are, are unitary. Okay, so I need to determine this. <coughs> okay. Next thing I will do, I will, uh, once I have done this, uh, so we, we want to find <coughs> the two degrees D1 and D2. We want to choose the two degrees <coughs> D1 and D2, and we have this constraint that we had yesterday, that we want the product of the two to be at least equal to the extension degree, okay? Because if it's too small, then there is no way if, uh, okay, when you do the substitution, when you compute F1 of F2 of X minus X, if the degree is smaller than K, there is no way there can be an irreducible factor of degree K. So this is a trivial bound we, we need to have. Okay, and then, uh, so I can either give you the answer, the answer directly, or we can we can seek the good, the, the best answer. Uh, maybe maybe we are going to seek the best answer. It's, it's better to give some to, to have some intuition about that. So we are going to take polynomial bivariate polynomial at the top of my diagram. Okay, one thing which is clear is that this bivariate polynomial should have some. Uh, we should bound the degree we are going to take in x and bound the degree we are going to take in y. Okay, so we have two degrees, not necessarily the same. So we have two degrees on, on, on the, two bounds on the degree. So uh, since we had d1 on, well, I'm going to, to call this bound maybe dx on dy, it should, be, it should be okay. Okay, so I have these two bounds, dx on dy. And let's see what is going to happen in the diagram when I move things around. So here, what is going to happen? I'm going to replace x by x, which is okay. And I'm going to replace y by something of degree d2 in y. So what is going to be the maximum degree if I have this bound on the degree of x and this bound on the degree of y? What is going to be the maximum degree I find? Okay, it's going to be the degree in x 
plus the degree in y time uh, well, time something which is the degree of uh, y in x so times d2 and on the other side I'm going to have dy plus d1 times dx and something I want to have clearly is I want to have some balance between the degrees because if one of the degrees is much bigger than the other it's clear that my choices are suboptimal. I should try to rebalance them to get a better probability of smoothness. So I'm going to try to balance these two stuff. So I'm going to say, okay, I want the two degrees to be roughly equal. Okay, so moving things around, it means that I want, I want what? I want d2 minus one dy to be roughly equal to uh, d1 minus 1 uh, dx. Mm. You know what? There is something there I don't like. Uh, no, it's okay. It's okay. So what I need is dy over dx to be roughly equal to d1 minus 1 over d2 minus 1. And assuming that the, the, these two degrees are reasonably large, this is going to be close to d1 over d2. Okay, so I, I am going to, uh, to fix some proportion between the two, uh, the two degrees. And this proportion is also going to be, it's going to be in D1, D2, and it's also going to be in Dx and, uh, and D1. So if you want to balance things nicely, you, you want something like this. Like this. Okay? Okay, so this is important. Um, so once we have done that, so let's give a name to this proportion, anything you want. So let's call it lambda. Okay, so write it up there. Lambda is going to be uh, uh, d1 over d2. Okay, so this is assuming that, well, we want one of the, one of the two to be bigger. So uh, if I write lambda this way, it would be nicer if d1 is bigger than d2. Well, because it, it's completely symmetric in x and y, d1 and d2. So. But uh, it's better to have lambda to be uh, bigger than one than smaller, smaller than one. It's always a mess when you have ratios which are smaller than one. You never know what you are doing with them. Okay, so I'm going to choose my ratio to be bigger than one just to make things simpler, in the, at least in my mind. I don't, know, I don't know for you, but things bigger than one are easier to manipulate. Okay, so we have this stuff and we are going to look in there what, is, what it is going to be, what is going to be the... Uh, the size of the polynomial and we are going to see what we can do with that. So on each side now we know that the two, the two degrees are going to be close to each other. So on each side uh, we are going to have uh, uh, we are going to have what? We are going to have uh, oh I forgot I just erased uh, so lambda was also equal to which one? dx over dy or so dy over dx? Okay, is that, it's okay? So it means that uh, this is going to be essentially dx plus lambda dx times d2. Okay, and since lambda d2 is d1, it's essentially the same thing as what we have on the other side. Is that okay? Yes, because, uh, because this is the relevant part of the degree. Okay, this is big, this is small compared to this, and this is going to be small compared to this. So the, the, the dominating part of the degree is just the higher term. Okay, if you really wanted equality, you shouldn't forget the minus one I had before, but it's a mess if we don't, uh, if we don't forget them. So. 
But roughly, we see something nice. So we have these two degrees, which are essentially, uh, so the degrees are essentially d1 times dx, okay. or d2 times dy. These are, these are the degrees we have. And uh, okay, and then this stuff is going to be down, to go down. Okay, and what we want now is we want things to be smooth on both sides. So we want things to factor into polynomial of degree at most. Okay, so I'm going to use my uh, I, I am going to use my rough approximation of the number. So just I'm going to forget the lightweight parts. Okay, I'm going to forget the lightweight part here. And I'm going to look at uh, the probability of smoothness th that appears. So, uh, so what is it on each side? Or you can do both sides together if you want, but it's the same. It's, it will give the same analysis. So you know that the log of the probability of success is going to be something like uh, the total degree divided by d times log of the total degree. Okay? That's classical. And now you want to balance everything. And balancing everything means that you want the ceiling space, the total number of elements you can consider up there, to be roughly equal to the square uh, to the square of the of the smooth of the size of the smoothness basis. Remember what we had, we wanted to balance both parts of the, of the algorithm. First, we construct relation. So constructing relation, if we ignore the cost of factoring, if we consider that it is uh, just unit cost to factor, <coughs> and with polynomial, it's much more true than it was with, uh, with numbers, so it's really good. Uh, so if we, if we ignore the cost of factoring, uh, we are going to spend a time, which is exactly the number of polynomial in, in in my set here. So this is the time I'm going to spend to look at the polynomial. Okay, when I look at this polynomial, uh, I will obtain one good relation with probability given by this. Okay, and I want the number of good relations to be roughly equal to the size of my smoothness basis to get uh, enough equation in my linear algebra part. And then I will do linear algebra. And I want, bo I want both things to cause the same thing. And linear algebra is going to be quadratic into the, the size of the smoothness basis. So this gives you, all this stuff tells you what you are, exactly what you want. Okay, so the stuff here tells me, okay, I want this to be roughly equal to D. Okay, and this looks a lot like what we had yesterday when we did the, when we did the, uh, the analysis of, uh, of the linear C, except that the constant is going to be different. Okay, so... <coughs> It's going to be slightly different, but it really look like, looks the same. Okay? So now I'm not going to go and try to optimize all this now because it's a mess. So I'm just going to give you the right answer that we, that we, want, to, that we want to have. And what, the right answer is going to really unbalance D1 on D2. What we are going to do is we are going to choose one to be larger than the other. So we already decided that if one is larger than the other, it's going to be D1. So what we are going to do, we want the product to be close to K. So what we are going to do, essentially, there might be some constant, but we are, what we are going to do is essentially choose D1 to be K to the 2 thirds and D2 be K to the 1 -third. Uh, that's it. And then, uh, which, which D1 is the expression of x in terms of y. So x is going to be a polynomial of big degree in y. And y is going to be a polynomial of, of small degree in x. So what we are going to do here, we are going to choose this to be 1. So degree in x. dx equals 1. And dy equals k to the 1 set. And when you look at this, you see that the size of the polynomial on both sides 
are going to be k to the 2 -thirds. Okay? Is that clear for everyone? Well, it's easy. In here, the big thing is going to be when you substitute x by your polynomial of degree d1 in y, the total degree is going to contain this k to the 2 thirds. So it will be there. On the other side, you will substitute something of degree k to the 1 third into something of degree k to the 1 third. So we'll, you will just multiply the two degrees and you will also get k to the 2 third. Okay, so, and then you will send things back down, downstairs here. And let's check that the probability is going to be essentially what we want. And we will be essentially convinced. I will not have done the full complexity analysis. I'm not going to go for the constant because we don't care for now. Uh, we just want to have an overview of the algorithms. But believe me, if you do things correctly, you will get the constant from this kind of analysis. But let's look at the probability. So minus log of the probability, what is it going to be? K to the 2 third. Well, saving here is going to cost something of the order of k to the of number of polynomial raised to the number of coefficients, so it's going to be p, p to the k to the one third times two. Because when you take a polynomial of degree one, you have two coefficients. So there is a two coming here for, for free. Which is nice because it, it tells you well, we are also going to take big D equal K to the one third, And everything is going to balance out magically. Okay, you will have K to the one third here. Okay, times a log of the same thing. Okay, so everything is of the right order K to the one third. The only thing that is missing to make the balance exact is to add a few constants here and there. But I won't do that. Because if you add the constants, and, well, it's a bit, bit of a mess. But if you want to do the full complexity analysis, you need to add the constant here and there, and, and you will get everything. Okay, and if you do the analysis fully, you will get the complexity I, I, I had on my podium yesterday. So you will get this complexity for small characteristic, which is going to be L of 2 to the k, 1 third, and cube root of, of 32 over 9. Okay, I'm not pushing the constant here, but believe me, that's what you will get. Yes? Do you use a small characteristic? Well, so I don't, didn't use the fact that P was 2. Here, you, you could have any characteristic, in fact. Okay, but depending on the characteristic, you will have to choose a different balance. Okay, because if the car depending on the characteristics, the size of the sieving space and, and everything is going to depend slightly on this prime. So remember, uh, when we had the very big prime at the other extremity, you choose polynomial of degree one. When, when I take two, I take polynomial of degree k to the one third. And in general, if you take p in the middle, what you take, what you choose for, at least for the smoothness basis, is you choose the degree in such a way that p raised to the degree is going to be L of one third of the total uh, size. Okay, so the balance is, but, but doing it in general, it's not very difficult, but it's a mess with notation, and so I don't want to do that uh, on the board. Okay, but essentially it's going to be the same thing. So we have these two extreme cases. The case we had yesterday where the prime was big, and the degree were one, and here the, the prime is as small as possible, and the degree are cube root of the total degree to to make everything balance out and be of the form L of the one, L of one third of everything. Okay, so I do that and I will obtain <coughs> the degree. I, I will obtain after doing the linear algebra the logarithm of all this polynomial of low degree. Okay. Well, I am lying a little to you. Not much, but I am lying a little. Um, What is the problem? Where, where, where is the, the, the place where I am lying? 
So the place where I am lying is when I write this equation doing exactly this in this way. I will always have the exact same degree here on the exact same degree there. So, well, let, to explain it easy, uh, in a more easy way, let's go back to yes, what we had yesterday. Only polynomial of degree one. And let's take an example. Assume that you have something with every time you are writing a relation, there are five polynomials of degree one on the left and six polynomials of degree one on the right. On the, on the left, it's polynomial in x, and on the right, it's polynomial in y. What I tell you is, assume I know logs. I know that it is going to satisfy uh, my, my system of, of equation. But now, assume I take a, vali a valid solution, and I add six to any polynomial, any log on the right, on the left, sorry, and five to any log <coughs> on the right. I can do it because they are separate set of variables. Then I will add five times six and six times five. So it will be the same. The, the, all the equation will, would still be satisfied. Okay? But if you add five to the logs on one side and six to the logs on the other, it will no, no longer will, will be good logs. It will no longer work. So the fact that the, the system are so symmetric that everything has exactly the same shape is adding some parasitical kernel element in my, uh, in my system and preventing me to find the logs di directly. Okay? It seems rather technical to say that, but if you don't do it, if you, if you just write the equations that way and try to solve and try to test your log, they are not going to work. So I, you are going to go, well, I don't understand. I have a solution of my system. My system are multiplicative relations. They are satisfied. Everything is nice. And the log are incorrect. Okay. So if, if this ever happened to you when implementing these kind of things, if, you, if everything is satisfied but the logs are still not correct, it means that for some reason, the system of, of, of equation you have written has some parasitical solution that is bothering you. Okay? So how do you get rid of, of that? Well, you just need to add a few extra equations that do break the structure. And it's very easy. You just you just slightly change the degree for one or two candidates. You do whatever you want. Uh, one thing which is very easy is you just take a polynomial in x of low degree. You put it there, and you substitute y. And if it factors, you get one relation which is not going to have the same set of symmetry. And even that is enough to recover everything. But if you don't do it, the algorithm is not going to work. So there are some. Very tricky things, and, and this explains why these algorithms are so hard to debug. Okay, because you have uh, you have this, you are in fact working blindly with this stuff. You don't know exactly what's happening. You have relation, you can test them, but then you do linear algebra and you, it pops out solution and they don't work, and you need to go back and backtrack and try to find out what's going on. And this is very this can be very difficult. Okay, but if you do it f correctly. It's going, it's going to be perfect. So once I do that in characteristic two, I know the log of all polynomial of degree up to k to the one sir. which is okay, something interesting. But now you have you are giving me an arbitrary element in there, and I want its log. So how am I going to proceed? Hmm. Well, I don't know anything when I start. So what you can do uh, first is do, you can do something uh, which, are, which is called continued fraction. And using continued fraction, you can slightly reduce the degree to half degree. But asymptotically, it's not going to help you much. So in practice, it's very important to do that. But asymptotically, it's not going to, to help you. Okay. So what can you do? Well. Uh, remember, yesterday we, we, we generated relation by taking random powers of two. Okay? Here there, you have a target, some polynomial, let's see, t of x, and you want the log of this target, t of x. Okay? So the first thing you are going to do is you are going to randomize your target. 
in such a way that instead of having a single target, you can get many of them until one of them is good enough for your purpose. Okay? What is good enough? Well, I say that something is good enough when it's split into many small terms. So if you are very optimistic, what you are going to tell me, if you are optimistic, is okay, I am going to randomize T until it factors completely into S. Okay, I'm going to take random copies of T until one of them factor into polynomial of degree smaller than cube root of, of K. If you can do that, that's perfect. <coughs> but what is the probability for this to happen? Well, I leave it as an exercise, but believe me, it's going to be way too high. Because we want something with total complexity L of one cell, and if you just hope for one polynomial to factor into the smoothness basis, ah, no way, it's going to cost you L2 cell instead of L1 cell, which is uh, way too high. Okay? Just, just put K here, K to the 1 third, and you, you see the K to the 2 third popping out. And then there is an extra log of it. And, okay, but it doesn't really matter. Okay, so we know that this is not going to work if we do it that way. So what you are going to do instead, you are still going to do that. You are going to randomize the stuff until it's good enough. But you are going to be less uh, strict in what good enough means. So instead of requiring the target to split into polynomial of the, of the very small degree directly in S, you are going to say, OK, I know this can't happen. So I'm just going to ask for the polynomial to split into stuff of degree k to the 2 third. OK? So I'm going to allow bigger elements. But you might say, OK, this is not going to help, because these bigger elements, they are not in the logs I know, so I can't do anything with them. OK? So now we need to, OK, you, you could tell me we need to do the same thing. But if you take a polynomial of low degree and randomize it into the finite field, it's going to be of high degree, so no way it can work. So now we can't randomize the polynomial anymore. We need to take them and find relation that will involve the polynomial we have with other polynomials of lower degree. Okay? And once again, there is no way to go directly from k to the 2 third down to k to the 1 third. We need to do many steps. So there is going to be what is called a descent tree. So starting from t, we are first going to do what I explained to you. You are going to randomize it until we get many smaller targets. T1 up to T, I don't know, Tn, of degree at most k to the 2 third. And then from each of those, let's take the middle one here. From each of those, we are going to find a relation that will involve that, and that will express that in terms of polynomial of, of slightly lower degree here. And by slightly, I mean you are going to try to divide the degree by some constant, or you are going to improve the degree by something. And then you are going to do it again, and again, and again, until you reach k to the one cell. And once you go down to k to the one cell, you know the logs, and once you know the log, you can backtrack up your tree until you get the log of everything. Okay, so th this seems computationally pretty intensive, but it's much less costly than uh, the initial part with, uh, with the linear algebra. Okay, why is it much less costly? Because obviously, well, it's, it's essentially linear. I'm just deriving equation and going down, and I don't have to to do this huge stuff with quadratic complexity. So this is going to be much more, much more efficient than the first one. So now the question is, OK, given some polynomial, anything, z of x, of degree smaller than k to the 1 third, how can I make 
I, how can I give an expression of z of x in terms of polynomial of lower degree? If I can answer this question, then I am done. OK? And what kind of tool do I have to generate multiplicative relation in my, uh, in my finite field? Well, I only show you one tool. So the tool is my commutative diagram. That's the only thing I have. OK, so I need to use my commutative diagram. OK, so I have some polynomial z of x now. And I want to do something with my commutative diagram to make sure that z of x will appear in the multiplicative relation I am generating. And if I can do that, it should be fine. Well, you want z of x on stuff of lower degree. So what do you do? So once again, you are going to choose polynomial, polynomial there, with some degree in x and y. The degrees are not going to be the same. They are going to be bigger than before. So now they are going to be big dx and big dy. But I will still keep the same ratio. I will still decide that uh, d. So x has a big degree, so dy should be bigger than dx. Oh. Let's see. When you replace, yes. uh, when you replace y by x, so the, the degree is bigger. So, okay. You want this to be equal to lambda. You still keep the same, uh, the same relationship between the two degrees. Okay? What, what you want to be sure is that z of x is going to appear in the factorization here with some other stuff of lower degree and some stuff of low degree. Okay? So the question is, how do I choose polynomial up there in such a way that, that when I do the replacement, z of x is going to be a, to be a factor of the, of the reduced polynomial? If I can do that, and if I can check that the degrees are not too high, then it will factor nicely as you, using the usual rule that, uh, for, for the probability of factorization. So the only question is how do I force z of x to be there? And this is, in fact, very easy. Well, you need to go backward and think about it. And, but in fact, it is just linear algebra. OK, what are we doing? We are taking monomials here of the form x to the i, y to the j. And we are taking sums of monomials. Okay? And when you do the replacement, when you replace y by the polynomial in x, this operation is linear. If you are taking a sum of stuff and then replacing the sum, it's exactly the same thing as replacing each term and then doing the sum. <coughs> if you multiply by a constant, you can do it after or before the replacement, it will be the same thing. So this map here is linear. So you want to find, you have this map which is linear, and you want to find a target which is divisible by z of x. What you do is you take <coughs> each of the monomial, you compute its image, okay, which is going to be x to the i times f1 of x to the j. And you look at this modulo z of x. Okay? So if z of x is a polynomial of degree something, let's say d. This is going to be a polynomial of degree d minus 1. So it will contain, it will be a vector space of dimension d. So now if you have more than d monomial up there, you will be sure that you, f you can find linear combination of, of those that will go to 0 mod z. So it means that z will divide. OK, so you have some, you, you need at least that many monomials. You add a few more to make sure that you can build, build many relations. And then you will enumerate these relations until you find one where this splits and this splits into stuff which is nicely smaller than the degree of z. By a factor of two should be enough. OK, because if you divide the degree by a factor of two at each step, 
then you will need a logarithmic number of, uh, of steps in the algorithm, and it will be enough to make uh, everything nice. OK, is that clear for everyone? I know it's a bit difficult when you see it for the first time, but uh, do you understand the linearity of this? Of this? And once you have the linearity of this, it should be clear that you want the kernel of a linear map, and you can. So this is just linear algebra. So finding coefficient, you can find a set of vectors of coefficients that generate this kernel, and then you take arbitrary linear combination of kernel elements, and all the combination you, you consider will have z as a factor. Okay, and with the same kind of probability as before, they are going to be splitting into nice terms of low degree. But you don't go directly. You need to go through these steps. And if you don't, it's going to cost you much more. So it's really important to, to think about this part. Okay. OK, so the last thing is if you fully do the complexity analysis of this, it will be L of 1 third. But the final constant will be smaller than what we had in the initial part. So this will be negligible asymptotically compared to the rest. And in practice, for records that we did for this, essentially, it's, it's, these records are quite old, the last I did, so I don't remember the exact data, but essentially, we, we had some computation for the initial phase that did run for a few weeks, and then every individual log costed around one hour. And it was about 10 years ago. So one hour, 10 years ago, well, well it depends. Now you take big, bigger fields, but but, OK, this is not going to dominate the, comp the, the computation. It's a pen to program, because you need to program all this recursive stuff of descent, and any bug in there is going to, to be a big mess <coughs> debug. But asymptotically, it's negligible. So it's really interesting, because you spend much more time programming this, which is asymptotically negligible, than programming the rest, which, which is the important thing. Okay. And in fact, at the end of the day, usually you don't want to program everything because it's so, to make it completely automatic, it's really a lot of work. So you end up doing the part of the descent tree yourself and adding logs and doing uh, massive <coughs> calculus using, uh, using GP or whatever uh, by yourself without having a big program. Okay, I know it's not a very nice way to do computation, but sometimes it ends up that way. OK? So in the depth of this tree, then? So the depth of this tree is, uh, is logarithmic. Uh, is something of the form log, log k. OK? Well, I have hidden some. When I tell you the degree should be k to the 2 third, it's slightly false. It should be k to the 2 third times log k to the 1 third. And all, all the exponents should be shifted that way. You should add a log to make sure that the total exponent are one. But nobody cares. Okay, it's just to give you the to give you an idea of the policy. Okay, if you want it to be L of one third, you, you always want to balance the people because this is what is happening in the L functions. Okay, but this is a technical detail. OK, so this is very important. This is, this I'm going to call, this is a classical descent step. So when I speak about descent, it is essentially uh, an equivalent of speaking about uh, the individual logarithm step. But I'm, I really focus on this part where you have this tree that goes down, down, and down. And what is very nice in this tree, is that the arity of the tree is low. Whenever you express z of x in terms of other stuff, the number of elements that appear here is bounded by some constant. Okay, so the number is small. Well, it's a bit more complicated than that. The, the number of elements of, de, of half degree cannot be too large, so it can be constant. But you might tell me, well, but if there are much smaller polynomials, there are going to be many more of them. Yes, but if you have much smaller polynomials, in fact, they are going to be way down the tree. So they are not going to count in the complexity, in fact. What is going to dominate the complexity is 
the thing which are just below in the tree. Everything that, any shortcut you can take in the tree is just going to improve things. So just ignore the shortcut, assume that all the elements that, in, that appear here are the worst case element of half degree or a fraction of the degree, and there can be only a constant number of them due to the relative degree of everything. Okay, you just do, you just add a degree and see that it cannot be, become too large. Yes? If you can descend, why don't you just keep on descending and get rid of the... Okay, you, you don't keep on descending because every time you descend, it costs something, mm -hmm. which is not too expensive. But if you, if you s try to go below this here, then any descent step below this is going to cost you more than L of 1 third. So all these descent steps are quite cheap, but the f if you want to go below this bound, it's going to cost you too, more, too much. Why? Because when you do this, this final step, essentially you are considering the same degree you have during the initial phase. And during the initial phase, we couldn't choose a smaller smoothness basis because the complexity would, would have been bigger. OK? So that's why you don't. Uh, that's why you don't. Uh, you don't go below that. Okay. And in fact, if you don't want to go so low in the tree, the descent is not is, is costing less. Assume that for some crazy reason you would you would only want to descend all the way down to k to the one half instead of going k to the one third. Well, instead of costing you L of one third, it would only cost you L of one fourth. Okay? And if you wanted to descend, well, if you want to only to descend to k to the two third, it costs you not too much. Okay. Well, it, it, it really depends on the way we are organizing things. Here I took a shortcut down to this, Spending L to the one third up there, but you don't need to do that. You can do it uh, differently, and, and you can go down to this k to the one half, spending only L of one fourth, using the classical piece. Okay. This might ring a bell somewhere, but okay. Uh, so that's the way it works when you want to do uh, when you want to do the list. Okay, uh, I have no clue what time it is and when I should. 10 minutes. Uh, I have 10 minutes. So it's a good time if you have any question. Oh, I lost everyone. Maybe. <laughs> so, yes. Yes. So the sets that you generate the intermediate steps. Yes. They really look at the bottom of your comment divider, right? But you. Well, yeah, 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 but if you have a poly, well, it's really easy to lift. Okay. If you have something which is a polynomial in X, you can, and what I didn't mention is, when you do this, you have polynomial of low degree in X, yeah. but you have also some polynomial of low degree in Y that appear. But you can do exactly the same thing. If you have a Z of Y, you're just looking at what is happening on the other side, or forcing Z of Y on the other side. So in fact, when you do the descent, you are alternating. Some of the dis part of the descent is using polynomial in x, part of the descent is using polynomial in y. But at the end of the day, you don't care because the smoothness basis contains all polynomial of low degree in x and in y. So going from one to the other is not a problem. OK? So that's basically a full uh, index calculus algorithm. Uh, and that's the best thing we had uh, before, two, uh, before 2012. Okay. And in fact, uh, is, uh, the final record that was done was done using this algorithm. And in fact, if you look in detail at the way they report their computation, <coughs> probably the descent was, uh, was not done correctly. They spent way too much time on the descent part compared to the rest of the computation. It was not negligible. It should have been negligible. Is that clear? It's
Okay, maybe what I can do now, because I see you are somehow skeptical and maybe, maybe tired. Uh, yesterday, a few of you uh, just came to me and told me to illustrate. They, they were not convinced by a few things, uh, such that how do you generate F1, F2, um, relation, and this kind of thing. So what we can do is just try to do a, a quick demo. So I have nothing ready, so we are going to do it online. But well, I did it yesterday, so it should be easy uh, to do it again. But uh, so I'm just going to to quit that, find a terminal, and <coughs> see what I can do with the terminal. Uh, this one, okay. I'm going to put a terminal somewhere on a nice screen. Uh, is this big enough for everyone to see it? Okay. So I'm going to launch. Uh, a quick and dirty uh, computer algebra stuff. So I'm going to launch deep GP. And I'm going to try to use this. So I'm going to find a, I'm going to choose a prime, choose an extension, uh, and then uh, try to generate a few relations in my scene. So trying to show you that finding F1 and F2 is easy in the context I had yesterday. And trying to do things, uh, finding a relation is also easy. So, well, uh, does anyone have a favorite prime? I don't want something too big, but okay, I'm going to take Nadia's favorite prime. Is this one okay? Okay. Then with this prime, I want to find two polynomials, F1 and F2, to define some extension over them. So I'm going to take an extension which is not going to be too big. So I'm just going to take two polynomials, let's say of degree five. And I'm, okay, you might tell me, well, 5 times 5, 25 is not, uh, is not the one we want to use because it's not a, a prime extension. So, I don't know. Uh, maybe we can just use an extension of degree 23. I think it's prime. So we are going to seek an extension of degree 23 uh, generated by two polynomials of, uh, of degree 5. Okay, so let's fix, fix F1. Well, if I remember what I said yesterday, this should be nice. Okay, so I'm taking this one. And then I'm going to search for a polynomial F2. Uh, so I'm going to, to search for a polynomial F2. So for, for one to, I don't say, no, maybe 100 should be F. So I'm going to put F2 equal y to the 5 plus y plus i. Okay, and then I'm going to substitute uh, substitute <coughs> into F2, replace Y by F1, subtract X. Factor this mod P. And then look at the degree of the last factor. Okay? D equal pol degree. I hope there will be no syntax error or something. F F for the math side. F F one one. Okay. If D equal equal twenty three. Oh, okay, I know. There is a syntax error. I should not put bracket here with parentheses. Okay, so it tells me, well, I can take either of 39, 71, or 98, and it's going to give me something I want. Okay, so let's choose maybe the smallest one. So you see, it's very easy. Well, maybe you can, you, you can tell me, well, these numbers are too big. Maybe we can try something else. Let's put a minus and see. Okay. With a minus, you get 11, which is better. Well, which looks better. So I'm going to take F2 <coughs> equal y to the 5 minus y plus 11. OK, so now let's look at the substitution. OK, let's factor this. 
and there is a, a factor of degree 23. So this is perfectly fine definition of my finite field. OK, and what I told you yesterday is, by the way, if I, in F1, if I replace x by F2, um, subtract y, there should also be a factor of degree uh, of the same degree. So let's do that. And there also is a factor of degree 23. So we are happy it works. We have the definition of our field. OK. So now I need to find, find some relation, some multiplicative relation in my finite field. OK. So I'm going, I want to find multiplicative relation uh, involving polynomial of linear degree in x and or, and or linear degree in y. So let's do that. Uh, I'm going to consider a simplified uh, simplify relation of the form y plus a times x plus b with only two coefficients. So just put this here to, to remember. A, a y plus a times x time plus b. OK, so I'm going to put a loop. I don't know, for a equal from 1 to 1,000. <coughs> for b equal 1 to 1,000. So I'm doing to do something utterly inefficient, but it doesn't really matter. So I'm going to first to factor mode. Uh, so let's remember, I just need to remember F1 <coughs> is a polynomial. So F1 plus A times X plus B, mod P. I'm going to factor mode uh, Y plus A times F2 plus B. So just replace y by a polynomial in x or replace x by the polynomial in y. Uh, so it's factor mod again. And I'm uh, again factoring mod p. And then, uh, then if, so I'm going to do something crazy, <coughs> if the size So it is really not the way to do, to do this. This is absolutely inefficient, but we don't care. OK, just close two parentheses. Maybe a third for the if. OK. So here are some relations. So you see, even with a completely crappy implementation, it's not that difficult to find the uh, relations. OK, uh, let's interrupt this. Let's choose one relation. I don't know. This one looks nice. Any, so it was A equals this, and B equals that. OK, and now let's take the factor mode and the factor mode. And that's a multiplicative relation in my finite field. OK, and what, what else can I do to, to convince you, maybe? Well, this one is very, very, well, it's clear. I'm not going to do anything with that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take all these factors here. I'm going to replace y by its value in terms of x. Look at this modulo, the polynomial that defines my finite field. And then it should be a polynomial of degree 5, which should factor into, into linear terms. So I'm going to build a complicated polynomial. OK, so this one. Um, so this is a mess. OK, okay. so I have, this, I have this stuff. I'm going to extract this. So I'm going to compute the product. Okay, so I have this. When you redo the product, you find this. So you might tell me, oh, it's surprising there are only a few number of, 
But this is normal for the, because of the choice I had for, 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 for F1. Okay. And then if I take this and reduce it, modulo, uh, where is the initial factorization up there? Okay, this. So this was my polynomial defining my finite field. Okay. <coughs> so what? What did I miss? I don't see what I missed, but oh no, the problem is not that. The problem is stupid. I is a reserved uh, keyword. It's square root of minus one. Okay, so this one is nice. So now I'm going to take uh, the, this product, and I am going to reduce it mod p. Well, it's already mod p, I think. So I'm going to reduce the product modulo and magically, you see it's a polynomial uh, in, uh, but you might say, tell me, well, there is a constant. Well, let's factor the constant out. We don't care about the constants. So let's divide this by this constant, which doesn't matter. Let's remove the mod to see something. So this is the polynomial. Oh, we recognize the one we had before. So of course, if we factor it mod p, it factors into linear terms. So you really have this multiplicative relation which really hold in my finite field. So I have these two elements, and I have these two products which are completely equal in my finite field. So this is a perfectly fine relation. Okay? Except that, I told you, all the relations are 5, 5. So if I add 1 to all the logs, I'm going to run into troubles. So how do I get rid of the troubles? Easily, you just uh, go back to the, to the loop here we add, and you say, OK, I'm just going to, say, to look at what happens. If I just factor mod something of the form x plus a. So I know it's x plus a. It's also a polynomial of degree y. Let's see if we can get a, an easy relation from that. And if we can, we will have one relation that will unbalance everything, and it will be enough to, get, to really get logs. So can we find one of those? I hope so. You can, in fact, find many of those. So it means that uh, if you have x plus uh, 45 in my finite field, uh, it's, in fact, going to be equal to, uh, to f2 of y. So, um, so if you take subst, uh, f2 plus 45 in this, so this is in y. So in this, you replace y by f1. OK, you get this. Uh, you multiply this mod p. You reduce modulo so stuff. And magically, you get back to x plus 45. So it's, um, we wanted to check that f2 plus 45, if you factor it mod p, you did get a relation. And this one is not 5, 5, it's 1, 5. So it's enough to break the symmetry. And that's it. 